everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Shut Up and Do It podcast. I'm your host, Nick Allerud, principal of AA Real Estate Group, a Boston-based home buyer and multifamily specialist and creator of the Complete Deal Flow System. Thanks for hanging out with us while we bring you all things real estate with a focus on bringing you top quality speakers and topics, all who believe in a get it done manner. Today, we have a recurring guest. I think you're the only one Fernando, that's been here on it twice so far. This is an epic, epic show. Fernando is a very young buck. He's based out of Chicago. He's safe, though. He has not tried to murder anybody. He's a 28-year-old senior managing partner of Titan Wealth Group based out of Chicago. He had a uh, residential wholesaling business. He still does. But now he focuses, I can't believe he's only 28. He focuses on self-storage investing. And today, he's got a special presentation coming back at us from his home office because of COVID, first of all, you're, how are you feeling? Fernando, are you still good? I'm feeling great, man. Yeah. You're feeling good. Family's good. Office is good. Everyone's good. Even better. Even better. We have a 0.000004% infection going on in Massachusetts right now. But, you know, high alert. High alert. High alert. So, wow. it's okay. We're all working from home. Hey, thanks for coming on today, man. And um, I'm really looking forward to this topic. If for those who didn't see the last episode, we'll make sure to link to the last episode in the show notes. Just tell us a quick, you know, history of you and how you got into real estate. Yeah. Started off in the nine to five life. You know, my parents are both immigrants from Brazil and they really hit home, you know, the American dream, go to school, get good grades, go get a good job, retire with a pension. Obviously that doesn't work anymore. So once I got out of college, I was working at a Fortune 50 company for about 13 months before I decided to quit, go into real estate full time. From there, I've tried every type of uh, real estate or almost every type, single family, multifamily, retail. We did flips, we did rentals, we did wholesale. And then finally, I was getting fed up with the dealing with tenants. Everyone talks about passive income, but once you actually start doing it, it doesn't feel very passive, does it? So once we found self-storage, we started going full bore ahead with that. I think the last time I was on your show, I only had maybe one or two facilities that we had held on to. Now we're up to, we just closed on our seventh one. We're closing on an eighth one, I think, tomorrow. And then we have five properties under contract currently. So those we'll talk about in here in a little bit. And COVID be damned. Look at all the business that's still going on here, huh? Yeah. That's incredible. If you want, yeah, tell us a little bit about how you even ramped up. And today's all about underwriting, which is what we want to chat about. Yeah. But if you don't mind, like share with some of the people as to what's the best way you're finding these deals? How can you yeah, get it's, them? it's kind of a multi-pronged approach. So the very first approach we took was kind of the wholesaler approach, right? Direct mail. We pull the list and that list is uh, an NAICS code list, which is a land classification code list. I believe that the code we use is 531130 lessers of mini storage and warehouse. We pulled the list and then we scrubbed out all of the top operators and top management companies and then just sent out direct mail, started getting calls in. But then as I've been doing this, I've been going on podcasts like yours, talking about self-storage, talking to other brokers, talking to investors. And now we're starting to get a bunch of people that are, you know, reaching out with properties they found or drove, you know, drove past or, Maybe they have it under contract, but they don't know how to underwrite it. And we just go in and either partner with them or buy it off them for a wholesale fee or wholesale it with them if we don't want to buy it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Good stuff. So it's just the same old, same old. And now it's relationship based, which is where everybody wants to get to. Good for you, right. brother. All right. If you guys are interested in learning why self-storage over traditional real estate investing, make sure you check out our last podcast, which is going to be in the show notes here. Today, he's going to be going over basically how to effectively underwrite a self storage deal, right? right, right. So let's let's have you take it away from there, my man. However, you, we want to start this, and if you got slides or screens, we'll figure it out. And if you don't, we'll just take it. Yeah. So I'm going to do about five topics here, and those topics are going to be traffic counts, local demand drivers, and demographics. We're going to talk about how you do a competition study. We're going to talk about supply and demand analysis, or what's called a supply index number. And then, last but not least, we're going to do the actual property analysis. Okay. So let's start. The very first thing we do when a, a property comes to us, before we start wasting any time, is what we do is a call it a chicken pox test or a polka dot test. We'll yeah, type don't, in the, don't say chicken pox right now, dude. Not yeah. exactly. <laughs> polka dot test. Polka dot test. That there sounds good. Go. So <laughs> we pull up the facility on call it, you know, 
Google Maps or Google Earth. And we just type in self-storage and then we do a local area search and then it'll pull up all the little red dots that are nearby. That's the very first thing. If we pull up a self-storage facility and there's a ton of red dots all over the place right next to the facility, it's probably not going to be a very good facility for us to continue. So that's going to be put down lower in the priority level in our leads, right? But if it's, say, not a lot of dots around it, maybe there's only two or three competitors, then we're going to start looking at it. The next thing we do is we look at the traffic counts on the main road and the curb cuts next to the facility. Easiest way to do that is you go to a you go to like the local traffic count data for the state. So like I'm in Illinois, so we go to IDOT or Illinois Department of Transportation, look up the traffic count maps and look at them. Ideally, we're looking for properties that have a minimum of 12,000 cars passing past the facility each day. The reason why is self-storage is an extremely localized business. 30 to 60% of your clientele are going to be coming from just driving past the facility every day. It's invisible to them until the day that they know that they need storage. All of a sudden, they see it on their drive to work, and they're going to stop in to check rates. Yeah, right time, right place, right message, right? Exactly. What we've also found recently is that now with the invention of you know cell phones and everybody's on their phone to find anything they want, 60% of our customer base will actually find our facility first and foremost on either the internet or on Google Maps. So that's one of the value add things that we look at is, does this facility, can you find it on Google? Does it have a website? These are all things that we're looking for, right? So say it matches all those criteria, then we go through and, actually I'll, I'll do a case study while I'm going through these. So yep. there's one that we purchased last year, it's called American Self Storage, it's in Danville, Illinois, okay? So the very first thing we did is we went to go look at traffic counts, it's right off of a major highway. We're looking for at least 12,000 cars per day. This one on I-74 actually had 26,000, 25, 26,000. So it hit that criteria, okay? The next thing that we're going to look at is the demand drivers or the demographics in the area. 70% of your self-storage tenants are going to be what we call residential tenants. These are, you know, just the average, you know, mom and pop living in a house. The very interesting thing that we found out was that most people think that these people that need storage live in a tiny little 200 square foot apartment. Turns out that's not the case. Only 27% of residential tenants live in an apartment. The other 65% live in a single family home. And of those 65% that live in a single family home, 65% have garages, 47% have attics, and 33% have basements. So there's a ton of storage, but for whatever it is, I think it's, I forgot what the rule is called, but your stuff expands to fit the space that you have, right? Kind of like the law of gases. Yeah. So that's the first a, type. There's a vacuum. Right. Right. Exactly. So that's the first type. 70% of your tenant base, residential clients. 17%, these are my favorite types of tenants, are your commercial tenants. These are the guys that local hardware guy, maybe he doesn't have enough space for a store but he rents a couple 10 by 30 unit facilities. Maybe one of our facilities had a, a tortilla manufacturing company. So they would manufacture tortillas, they'd drop them off at the self-storage facility as a halfway point, and then the semi-trucks would go pick them up from our self-storage facility and then take them across the nation, right? So that's 17%. I really like the commercial tenants because they have a super long average lease time. They, on average, stay about 25 to 26 months before moving out. And that's on average. We have some other, some guys that have been there for 10, 12 years. So those are the two major. Then you have two smaller groups, which are the next biggest, and that's going to be students. That's about 6%. The problem with students is that they usually will swell your occupancy in the summer. And then once they go back to, to school, your occupancy drops back down. Then the final class is military. A lot of military, they get called on to duty usually don't have a lot of notice and they just need a place to store their stuff. They'll usually be, you know, average stay time of anywhere between call it 12 to, you know, 13 months. So what we do is the very first thing after looking at traffic counts is we zoom out on the Google map and see, is there a lot of dense residential or maybe like a commercial park in the area? If we, if we see that the self storage facility is surrounded by a, Single family and multifamily homes, that's a huge plus for us because that's where all of our clientele are going to come from. What you find out is that 
in an urban area like downtown Chicago, 90% of your tenants are going to be coming from a one mile radius. If you're in like the suburbs, your trade area is what they call it, is about three miles. And then if you're like in the super far suburbs or what we call the exurbs, you're looking at about a five mile to maybe a 10 mile radius if it gets a little bit more rural, right? So these are highly localized. And this is a way that you can find opportunities to serve underserved pockets. Unlike say multifamily where, you know, I live in Chicago, I live on the South side of Chicago. At any time, if I want to go, you know, go to the North side, that's a 10 or 15 mile drive there's no problem, especially if I'm, if I'm a tenant that's like chasing rent, right? Some a cheaper rent with self storage. That's not usually the case. People don't want to drive 15 miles out of their way to go store their stuff, especially if they want to stop there. So that's the demographic part. The next part that we look at is population growth, right? We want to see heavy population growth. That's always a good, uh, that's always a good thing for our long-term buy and hold self storage facilities. When there's pro- population shrinkage, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're not going to go after that property. It just means that we probably won't hold it for 15 or 20 or 25 years. The reason why is self-storage, we serve people in transition, right? You got a new job, you're moving, maybe you're, you're upgrading house, downgrading in houses. That's why right now with this whole COVID thing, our self-storage facilities are doing really well. Our occupancies have actually jumped a, a, over our usual ceilings in each one of our markets. And that's because people are right now, I'm assuming yeah. downsizing and, but they don't want to throw away all their, you know, their drawings from their kids and the sentimental stuff. They're not going to throw that away. So they're going to downsize from say a 2,400 a month mortgage to a 1,200 a month mortgage and then go get a hundred dollar per month self storage, you know, unit from me. So on this property here in Danville, we looked at the demographics and we saw, okay, we have a household income of about 40,000. There's a population of about 35,000 in the five mile trade area. And there's about 16 to 17,000 housing units with a new casino that was just approved to to start construction. So that's gonna bring on a lot of jobs. It's gonna bring a lot of transient workers. That's gonna be good for self storage, right? Rule of thumb is we wanna see about a 45,000 plus median income. That's a good start for your first facility. Once you get more advanced, then you can start kind of discounting some of these things as long as some of these other factors are really good for you, like that casino, for example, on this one. Gotcha. And it seems there are, yeah, there's a lot of factors here. Going back to your one, three, and five mile outs, right? So you have your main suburbs, your city, your suburbs, and then your exurbs, is that what you said? Yeah, exurbs. All right. I know those are just like sort of the geographic ranges, but do you like either one of those better? What's your favorite out of those three? Yeah, I love three mile and five mile. I'm never going to buy properties in downtown urban areas because there's too much competition from the big boys, the REITs, right? These REITs are making crazy offers on those types of facilities in the four, four and a half, five percent cap rate ranges. I'm usually buying self-storage facilities day one at the eight and a half to the 12 percent cap rate range. So just de facto, because of the numbers I need to hit, that pushes me farther out of the urban core and into the suburbs and into the exurbs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. And then, so that one mixed with the income mixed with the population growth, maybe you're not even done yet. I apologize, but are you able to then rank what you feel is the most important to least important? Exactly. Yeah. So we will always look to see, okay, you know, there's so much you can do in a, with a desktop study. But then you have to go in and, and physically drive the market and see what's it like, right? And that's kind of what we did. When we got to our next you know, underwriting criteria, which is a competition study, we actually found out a lot of things we didn't know just by driving the specific market. So how I do these competition studies is we're talking about that one, that three, and that five-mile radius, right? So what I'll do is I'll actually go into Google Earth, and I'll use the drawing tool, and I'll draw these concentric circles, a one, a three, and a five-mile radius around my self-storage facility. Then I'll pull up, I'll type in self-storage facilities in Danville, Illinois, and it'll pop up all the competition around me, and I'll see where are they in relation to my facility. So when I initially did this, it pulled up a bunch of self-storage facilities all over the place. And I usually like to see, you know, a subject property that only has one competitor in a one mile radius, maybe two or three competitors in a three mile radius and a, maybe another handful in the five mile. 
we were way above those metrics. But then once we drove the market, I drove to each one of the competitors. Turns out half of those competitors had gone out of business long ago and they never pulled down their Google listing pitch. So that immediately got rid of half of the competitors. So that, that's an advantage that I would have over, say, like a larger player that buys 100 facilities a year because they're not going to drive every competitor at every project they're looking at. So that's how we get an edge as a, as a smaller investor. That's awesome. And before you're even driving out though, Fernando, you're like, you're just at your desktop computer. Does, sound, does that all just take you, what, 40, 40 minutes, if that, to do? Yeah, so the whole underwriting process, we can probably get it done in about two hours. Yeah. yeah so that's insane. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So, so you, like, it, go back over your um, key indicators again. So you have your one, three, and five mile, and you said mm-hmm. three and five are the best. Keep, I'll let you talk. I'm just trying to sum things, sum things up yeah, here. Yeah. So one, three, and five, I don't want to see a lot of competition in those areas. Once I see what type of competition there is, I start to secret shop them over the phone. So I'll, I'll call them and I'm saying, hey, I'm looking for a, I'm looking for a couple units. I'm trying to see... You know, if you got anything available, what are, what are your pricing? So the very first thing I do is I start writing down all the pricing because then I can see is the facility that I'm buying, is it below market? Is there an opportunity for me to raise rents day one and then just do a quick value add? The nice thing about self-storage is because it is a, a commercial asset, it's not valued based off of comps. It's valued based off of the amount of income, net operating income that it can produce. So if I can day one, just send a letter to all the tenants that I have after I close and I say, hey, we're raising you guys up from 70% of street rates all the way to 95 or 100% of street rates. I've just increased the value of that facility by, you know, if I'm buying it at a 10 cap and I raise the NOI on the facility by 20 grand, I just raised the, the valuation on that property by $200,000 in one day. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Okay, that's when you're starting to get, you change your voice when you call them, right? <laughs> you know, usually it's funny. What we usually do now is instead of kind of secret shopping them, we just call kind of call as like a symbi- symbiotic business and say, hey, you know, we're a logistics company slash moving company. We found that when self storage in the areas at ninety percent plus occupancy, our business does really well and we'll send you referrals as well to anybody that's moving in and out of the market. Are you at ninety plus percent? And the reason why we specifically ask for that number is self storage is considered one hundred percent stabilized at ninety percent occupancy. The reason why is if you're at hundred percent occupancy, that means that your rent rates are too low. If you're below that, then there's, there can be a, a lot of factors that add to that. So if I find out that everybody in the market's at 90% plus occupancy, that's a really good sign for my facility. Will they give you that information? Like yeah, for- usually if, yeah, usually when you call, you're just talking to like a low-level manager, you're usually not talking to an owner. And they're not thinking about, oh, do I need to protect this information? They're just thinking about how do I get these properties rented or how do I bring in more you know, more income for the owners so that they give me a better bonus at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So with this Danville property, we called the closest competitors all within a five mile radius and they were all at 95 to 98% occupied. That tells us that there is a, there is a uh, shortage of storage versus the amount of demand in the area. Fantastic. Okay. And so when you took that information that you gathered from those competitors, it had, it had the, the density or, or lack of density that you had wanted on your desktop, your polka dot test, right? Right. And then you checked on population growth. You checked which, uh, what was the number for population growth? Oh, I just, I just like to see that it's going up. If I'm going to hold it long term, if it's going down, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means that I won't hold it long term. I may, you know, quote unquote, flip the property. So I'll buy it. I'll do the value add and I'll immediately sell it in 18 to 36 months. Gotcha. Okay, cool. And then you checked on the median income, which was roughly, was it at your level that you wanted, the 40 to 45? It was slightly below. So it was was at about a 39,000, 40,000 median income. We like to see roughly 45. So slightly below, but again, not a big deal. Once you start seeing some of these other factors that we'll go through here. Gotcha. And then when you did, you, you started to see there was high demand for it. You could probably raise rates. And is there anything else on that deal you wanted to go over on the underwriting side? Yeah. So once we've got all the competitors and I've drawn those concentric st- circles, 
Then we look at the meat and potatoes, which is the supply index number. And this is usually what is, takes the most amount of time to do because we do it all manually. So how we, we find the supply index number, which is the, the gauge on how much demand there is in the market, is by taking your concentric circle, picking what's appropriate. So this Danville facility, it's more of an exurb, more of a rural style development. So we chose a four mile trade area, okay? Okay. Supply index is a ratio of total net rentable square feet or square feet of self storage space that is that people can actually put boxes and, and stuff into divided by the population in that circle. Okay. So net rentable square feet divided by population is your supply index number. You're usually shooting for a seven net rentable square feet per capita or lower number. Okay. So for example, Seven net rentable is somewhat considered the national average for equilibrium. So if I come across a facility that is at 3.5 net rentable square feet per capita, that means that I can double the total amount of storage in that area to meet the demand, to hit equilibrium. Okay? Gotcha. Okay. So we started looking at this Danville property and we started running the, the demographic data. And how we do this very easily, you just go on Google Earth, which is a free program. You find each one of your competitor self-storage facilities, and then you just draw boxes around them to find the square footage. There's a measuring tool in Google Earth. This is all free, right? Once we did that, we divided it by the total population in that concentric circle, and you can find that very easily using a, an, a free app called SiteWise Mobile. You just drop a pin, tell it how many miles the radius is, and it'll tell you the demographics in that radius, okay? And we found that for this facility in a four mile radius, the supply index was a four net rentable square feet per capita, which means we can add a, a whole almost, we can almost double the amount of storage in the area to meet demand. So that means that there was more demand than there was supply, which was good for us. That's okay. <laughs> okay. So that was, that was the first four, right? So the first four, four, just to recap was traffic counts. Number two is demand drivers and demographics. Number three was competition study. And number four was the supply study, which is the supply index number. And then if all of that checks out, then we actually start running numbers on the property. So number five is the property analysis itself. We're gonna look at the unit mix. Does it have a lot of small units like five by five? Does it have a lot of big units like 10 by 30s? I'm a fan of larger units, usually 10 by 15 or larger. So 150 square feet or larger because those stay rented longer. When you look at those unit mixes, you want to compare your size units to what all the competitors are charging. So say, for example, my unit or the, the facility I'm buying a 10 by 10 is priced at 45 bucks. But then when I look at all the competitors that are 100% full, they're all charging $73. So that's a huge opportunity for me to come in and day one, just raise rents before I do anything and raise the, the value of the property by two, three, 400,000, depending on, you know, the purchase price of the property. Would you do anything before just raising rents to make them feel like they were getting anything? I know like value add multifamily, you do a few things, right? Yeah. So we, we do it. We do this all basically simultaneously, right? So we start doing, improvements to the security because self-storage is all about security of someone's goods right and so we look at can we add climate control units can we add cameras can we gate the facility if it's not gated can we put interior and exterior access using keypads so that a person doesn't even have to be there for you to go in you can go into your facility at midnight if you want right we look at putting security lights in so we start doing all this but what we do is day one we send a you know, we're the new owner letter. And in that letter, it says that we're going to be raising rates in three months. So three months from the day that we buy it, the, raise, the rates are going up by this amount. And we're doing that because over those three months, we're going to be doing all of these improvements that we're going to be, you know, that we're telling that we're, that we're going to do here. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Right? Yeah. We call that the friendly takeover letter. Right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, after I look at the rents, then I start looking at the expenses because again, there's two ways to raise NOI, you either increase your income or you drop your expenses. And what I've found is a lot of 
mom and pop self storage facility owners don't have a very good grasp on their expenses. So the very first thing we do when we come in to affect the ex ex expenses is we get a new insurance quote because our property insurers specialize in self storage. So they know there isn't as much liability as there is say in an asset that there is habitation by living people, right? In self storage, humans are not supposed to be staying in those units. So there's less liability to an insurance company, right? Because your biggest liability is general liability, somebody getting hurt, falling, dying, those types of things. So that's number one. Number two is we hire a tax attorney to go contest the property taxes. What we found is a lot of these self storage owners, they have never done this and they've just paid the taxes and didn't even know that they can fight them. And what we found when we go to the counties is that they're usually putting in a totally different asset class into the bucket that they use to average. So for example, to find out what my mill rate is, the county may say, okay, well, this medical office building is paying this amount of taxes and this commercial strip center is paying this amount in taxes. We have nothing to do with those types of properties. So we fight them and about 66% of the time, two thirds of the time we win on getting our property taxes reduced. A second strategy that we use to reduce those property taxes is that when we go buy the self-storage facility, remember, not only is it a real estate asset, but you're also buying a business. So what you can do is say, hey, I'm going to buy this facility for $800,000. So we're going to talk about Danville here. I'm going to buy this facility for $800,000. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay $550,000 for the actual land and the improvements and then I'm going to pay another 250000 for the goodwill of the business. A county cannot tax you on the goodwill of the business. They can only tax you on the land and on the improvements upon the land. So that's a very quick way to get your taxes dropped immediately. Hmm. Did you guys use attorneys for that or are you doing that in-house too? Yeah. No, we use attorneys. Usually, so it's one of those, what I call, it's a low value activity for us. It's a high value activity for an attorney, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. They know how to do it. They have all the connections and we don't have to pay them up front for that. Usually the way that these tax contesting attorneys work is that their fee is one third of the amount of tax they saved you in your first year. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so if they drop my property taxes by 6,000 bucks, I owe them a check for two grand once they're done. If they're unable to get them to drop the taxes, I don't have to pay anything. Gotcha. And that specific center that you, you've been referring to, mm -hmm. so you did all your due diligence on it, said, yep, we're going to pull the trigger on it. Mm -hmm. You then pulled the trigger and you affected your value adds. Have you gotten through the process of a refi or resale yet? So we're about to actually do that. So this property we bought about a year ago. We are about 80% through the value add process and we're going to lump this property in with another six properties into a life insurance loan and push all of the, that portfolio into a little fund that we're starting. And it'll be a fixed income fund basically. Gotcha. Very, very, very cool. And that's all another topic that we'll definitely be having you on for another time. Um, okay. But uh, let's talk about, maybe you want to pick one more of your deals that you we're working on and we can do to bring us through that process too? Sure. So uh, here's a deal that we just finalized today, about 30, 40 minutes ago. It's fresh off deal, the presses. Yes. Fresh off the presses. So I was talking about how I love partnering with people that don't know what they're doing in storage and teaching them by making them an equity partner in a deal, right? So we have a mutual friend, John Carcone, who's in the Collective Genius Mastermind with both of us. He's a master marketer. You tell him to go find anything, he can find it, and he can find it in droves. So I said, hey, John, I know you like storage. You've been talking to me about storage for maybe six months now. You want to get involved? Start marketing, and then I'll handle the rest. So he did that. He found these two properties in Kansas, $5 million total for the portfolio. We wanted it to only pay about 450 or 4.5 million uh, for that portfolio. So then I was like, ah, man, we, we really like this deal. It hits all the metrics we like. How do we get this done? So then we, we tapped into another mutual friend of ours, uh, Eddie Speed, that runs the Note School. And he teaches people how to buy and sell on terms, on seller finance. And what we ended up being able to do is taking that 500,000 difference that we were apart from the seller, turning that into a second position seller held mortgage over 20 years and with a stair-step model. 
you know, first third of that 20 years, we're going to be paying 2% interest. So, so that's going to drive down the amount of principal, which is great. All the payments are going to be basically all principal. Then in the second third of that 20 years or the next 80 months, it jumps up to 4%. And at the end of that 80 months, so now we're at 160 months, the seller has a call option where he can, he can call the loan due. But to entice him not to do that on the last 80 months or the last third of the 20-year mortgage, we step up the interest rate to 6% for him. Now to him, he loves that. But if you understand how mortgages work, you realize that you pay most of the interest in the front half of the amortized schedule, right? Mm -hmm. So by the time that we're paying a 6% mortgage, we've already paid a ton of the principal down on that property. That's the secret. There it is right there. Look at this. So Fernando's coming at us today with self-storage underwriting, self-storage value adds, and he just gave you a course in Eddie Speed's note school. <laughs> Pretty much the value add king dude right here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Fernando, that's a ton of information. And what's the best way that you want to work with people as you go forward? Yeah. So uh, thanks to another mutual friend of our, Ryan Pineda. He's been pushing me to start getting my social media game up, you know, up there. So I started a new handle on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It's called The Storage Stud. Yes. So if you want to, if you want to reach out to me, reach out to me on Instagram, reach out to me on Facebook, on LinkedIn. It's all, if just type in The Storage Stud, you'll find me, you'll find my website as well. We're looking to work with people, right? So if you're looking to, you know, get into self-storage, you know, give us a call. If you have a self-storage deal that you maybe drove past or you need help underwriting, you know, give us a call. We love working with people. We've already partnered with probably four or five different operators in the last 12 months that knew nothing about storage beforehand. They were single family guys, multifamily guys, mobile home guys, some guys that were just doing stuff in the stock market, right? And they've called us and they've partnered with us. What geographies are you looking for specifically? Have you honed in on any? All, all over the place. So we invest in 24 states. It's too long of a list to go over right here right now. But basically, if it's in the Midwest or it has low, low state taxes or low property taxes, we're investing there. All right. Well, Massachusetts is out, but you didn't want that anyway with COVID. So forget <laughs> it. we're high risk. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, maybe the, you know, the urban core doesn't make sense, but maybe some of the surrounding areas make sense, right? Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Fernando, this was like an awesome value add presentation. You know what? Let me ask you one of our, our parting questions that we have for some people, sure. right? I think I already asked you one of these before. I'm going to ask you a different one this time. And this is actually very relevant. So for those of you watching this podcast, you know, it's late March here in 2020, and we're in like week three of this quarantine, right? right. And we're all working from home. You know, our, our office is all working virtually from home. And Fernando, even though he has a full setup with his podcast equipment, whatever, is working from home too. What routines do you work with every day to get you moving? Do you have a routine? I do. Yeah. So um, especially recently, now that I can focus on it, you know, kind of being in quarantine, uh, I really like to go to sleep early. I like being up and at them before everybody else. And the reason why is usually around 8.30, 9 a.m., my phone and my email just start blowing up and I get so distracted I can't get anything done. So recently I've been waking up between 3.30 and 5 a.m., getting my, you know, my coffee in, doing a quick workout to get the, the blood flowing, and then I get in the office. And then I usually have four to four and a half hours of solid you know, productive work that I can get done before my email starts going off, before my phone starts going off. I really love that. Recently, I've also been doing some, some health stuff with my diet as well. So I've been, you know, focusing on eating right, eating, I keep my body in ketosis right now. I'm doing a kind of a one meal a day type or OMAD for some of the people that are in the know out there. And then, you know, drinking a ton of water. I haven't been drinking any alcohol recently, which is new for me. I know on the last podcast, I think I was drinking on the podcast with you. Uh, <laughs> you're flashing your, your New England Patriots mug at me. So. That was it. Yeah, we, we don't want to talk about that right now. Ooh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the nice thing, too, is by doing this, you know, I'm, I'm usually done working by 3 p.m. And then that gives me from 3 to 6 or 7 o'clock to go spend time with my friends and my family, especially while the sun is out, which I really love. And then once the sun starts dropping, I go to sleep. Yeah. 
That's awesome, dude. You've lost a ton of weight. You already know that. I've congratulated yeah. you a few times. Before he was in his OMAD phase, Fernando and I were doing uh, our intermittent fasting together and then our three and potentially five day fasts. So yes, if you want to talk about that, you can Instagram him at the storage stud. Yes, the storage stud. The storage stud on his handle. And you guys all know where to find me at AA Real Estate and AA Real Estate Group on uh, in the Insta and the Facebook and the Twitter. Ooh, oh gosh. LinkedIn, whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fernando, thank you for being on today, my man. You added a ton of value. And there will be even a third time if you're ready for that when that I day am comes. Almost ready. <laughs> hey, folks. Thank you so much for taking part in another episode of the Shut Up and Do It podcast. We bring as much value as we can by sharing top quality guests and speakers. A huge thank you today for Fernando Angelucci. I did there that, right? Yeah. Got it. Got it. Uh, who spoke today on self-storage underwriting and self-storage value add and even gave you a brief lesson in note school from any speed, which is awesome. Be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons below to be notified when we have new podcasts released and head over to the shutupanddoitrealestate.com for all the episodes. Thank you guys so much for joining us and I'll catch you on the next one. Thanks, Nick.